Hello everyone, this is Terry with Futures IO, and as always, I would like to thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure to welcome David Lurbin and Max Timmons for the benefits of trading the micro E-minis with Stage 5 Trading in the CME Group. Throughout the webinar, if you have a question, please be sure to type them in the question box. We'll do our best to answer them by the end of the event. This webinar will be recorded and posted on the Futures.io website within 24 to 48 hours. If you watch this afterwards on YouTube, please do us a favor and give us a thumbs up if you enjoy the webinar. And as always, please feel free to share, comment, and subscribe to our channel. It really helps us a lot. If we're sharing news, events, and information, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Use the gap Futures.io. And now, without further delay, I'll hand it over to David and Max, and y'all get the pop-up to share your screen, Dave. Okay. Can Bye. everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Looking good. We're good to go? All right. Thanks very much. All right. Today we're going to talk about the micro E-minis. Uh, I've been with the CME Group. My name is Dave Lerman. I'm a director in education here. I've been with the CME Group 31 years, and uh, I've been associated with probably 100 to 200 product launches. Uh, four or five of them were gigantic, high-profile, lots of buzz. This is one of them. Uh, along with the E-minis back in 1997, uh, the micro E-mini futures have generated more interest than uh, almost any product launch I've had. So we're very, very excited. So on behalf of the CME Group and myself, Dave Lerman, my colleague here, Paul Camout, uh, I want to say thank you to Stage 5 Trading for hosting this webinar. And we're just going to dive right in. A couple little disclaimer here that we're going to talk about. Uh, neither futures trading nor swaps trading are suitable for all investors, and each involves the risk of loss. So you're going to have to do your homework on these things, all right? Uh, I know that the group here that we're talking to is a much more advanced than the typical trader out there, so hopefully we can skip some of this, uh, this uh, disclaimer language. Uh, we have a little humorous uh, comic here that came from a book I wrote a long time ago, and it says, yeah, can he beat the S&P 500? Uh, and that's where this whole thing launched. We're going to give you just a little bit of history here, how we've come to this point, why we're launching a micro, and then we're just going to get into strategies. The entire last 50, 60% of this webinar will be strategies and things uh, about the micro that will help certain traders and things like that. Uh, but that's all about beating the S&P 500. It was a big challenge, and it still is a big challenge. Most money managers have a very difficult time beating the S&P 500. So as a result, a whole lot of passive index products were launched. Among them were futures and options. Uh, back in 1982, we launched the standard pit trade at S&P 500. And uh, we'll see the history a little bit later on, but there was also a lot of mutual funds indexed to the S&P 500 and other indexes too and also uh, ETFs, mutual funds, options, all sorts of swaps and derivatives. And uh, as you know it, it's a very, very big market. It's in trillions of dollars. There's an incredible amount of critical mass, a term I'm going to use a few times over the next few minute, moments. And uh, it's, it's just spawned this entire industry and a lot of great trading opportunities for traders such as yourself. We started out with floor trading and open outcry with the S&P 500 pit traded version back in 1982 of April. Uh, we then, you know, as things progressed uh, into the 1990s, electronic trading took hold and our Globex match en matching engine and computer traded system now basically accommodates about 90, 95% of our trading now. So uh, there's been a lot of progress made in not only trading, but in index trading and stock indexes as well. We have a chart here on slide six, uh, very interesting. It's got the top 10 most active, probably the most, arguably the most liquid uh, stock index futures contracts around the globe. And uh, if there's anything you notice on it, of, of those top 10, uh, we own four of the top 10 spots. And of the top three or four, we have two of them, the E-mini S&P and the E-mini NASDAQ. So we've been very fortunate and a big thank you to folks at you know, Stage 5 Trading and all our clients out there that have helped make this liquid. They're the ones that have made it a success. We have a lot of hedge fund participation, a lot of active traders, arbitrageurs, prop, proprietary traders, uh, pension funds, endowments, FCMs, everybody's gotten in on the act. And that's how you get 1.6 million contracts a day. You have to have all those ingredients in the mix, in the pot, so to speak, to uh, generate that. Open interest is 2.69. The most important thing, though, is uh, the 210 or $220 billion of average daily dollar volume. Uh, there's nothing that really comes close to that, and that number will become even larger, loom larger as we, again, go on in this webinar. But you can see number two, E-mini NASDAQ, 100, a half a million a day, almost a quarter million open interest. 
Now we have the mini Dow futures, quarter million a day, about 77,000 open interest in the mini Russell 2000. We're rebuilding liquidity and volume and open interest since getting it back from ICE. It's about 138,000 with a half a million in open interest. So again, we're very fortunate. We've, we've built some great infrastructure, a great trading community, and we have four of the top 10 spots. We hope, we uh, would like to think that at some point the micros join this list too, but we'll see. That remains to be seen. So why micro e-minis and why now? Well, we need, a, we need to right size uh, something for individual traders here. We, uh, as we're, if, if you look at this long running bull market we've had over the last 10 years, um, it's this, and not only the last 10 years, this is the last 20 or 30 years, uh, but some of the notional values of our, our equity contracts have gone two to three times uh, what they were when we launched. So well, that's priced a lot of active traders out of the market. The margins, the notional value, the intraday price swings were just a little bit much for some, uh, some traders. And again, more on that later. Uh, a little policy of no trader left behind, a uh, little play there on the words of George Bush's uh, legislation a long time ago, no student left behind, no child left behind, whatever. Uh, the market just needed a product that offered the benefits of our stock index futures quadrant and that it would appeal to a wider swath of traders. So we came up with the solution. It was basically, uh, in quotes there, a 10 for one split. Now, we're not splitting the S&P 500 10 to one. That's not what's happening. We're not splitting the futures contract. We're just doing a smaller multiplier. It's gonna be a separate futures contract. So we'll have three generations of S&P futures. Now the standard pit traded one, the large one with a 250 multiplier, We'll have the E-mini S&P 500 and the E-mini of the other products too with a one, one fifth the multiplier or 50 multiplier and the micro E-mini S&P 500. Uh, and again, the other ones, and we'll get to those in a second with a $5 multiplier. So it's just taking a contract and making it one tenth the size. That's really it. So it, uh, it allows you know, people uh, to have a smaller size contract. Um, and that's really the, the whole spirit of it uh, because again, uh, this large bull market, this great bull market we've had is pricing a lot of traders out of the market. All right, so the current landscape, it's also, it's, it's pretty ripe to have a micro contract. Uh, as we said, the notional values for the stock index complex, they've, uh, they've increased substantially and they eclipse a lot of our other futures contracts. I have a chart coming up on the next slide and you'll see what I mean on that. Uh, this thing will benefit a lot of newer traders too, those with smaller accounts. Uh, the micro e-mini has a lot of advantages over ETFs. Uh, we'll get into that too. Each one of these will have its own slide towards the end of it. And we'll get into a little bit more detail. Uh, also, I understand from my uh, feelers out there in the brokerage community, there's a lot of new futures accounts that have been opened up, but none of them have really commenced trading yet. I think this is a kind of a product that will be a, a catalyst, if you will, for people to begin trading uh, futures contracts. And the micro is a perfect um, product to, to begin trading because of its small size and a little bit less risk. Uh, the micro contract offers all the advantages of our equity products, uh, but at one tenth the size. It's great for traders as well as hedgers. Uh, if you have ETF exposure, if you have mutual fund exposure, uh, whether it be within, without a 401k or an IRA or whatever, uh, it allows you to stay your position and hedge against any kind of uh, adverse impact. So, and that's a good thing because if you have an ETF or you have a mutual fund and you were to sell it instead of hedge it, you would uh, not get any dividends anymore and you'd also have a taxable event if it was outside uh, a tax deferred or tax free umbrella. So that's a good thing. You'd get to keep your dividends and you wouldn't have a taxable event if you hedged using the micros. Uh, some firms, because of net worth or uh, the, the size of an account, they may not be eligible to trade futures. Well, the micro mate, uh, might just be just the piece of pie that they want. Uh, it allow new traders to reduce risk from two viewpoints. Margin, you'll have to put a lot less margin down and the actual dollars at risk will be a lot less too. Uh, and also the, one of the best things, uh, the micro smaller size allows a flexibility and more precise trading. Uh, so you can scale in and scale out. We'll have a couple of trading examples that show that a little bit later on. Uh, it's something that professional traders do all the time, scaling in and scaling out and uh, the, the micro will allow people to do that. All right, so here's the chart I referred to. It basically shows some of our major contracts here at CME Group and the notional value and the margin that you had to put up. And then inserted in there, I have it uh, just verbally, uh, you can see it. But the standard S&P is $700,000 contract. So a 1% move in the standard S&P is $7,000. Uh, there's not a lot of futures traders out there that, that can handle that kind of thing. Uh, professionals, yes. 
people well beyond the novice stage, yes, but uh, everything migrated to the Mini, and the Mini's got about $145,000, uh, $140,000 notional amount. The Mini Nasdaq's about $146,000. You can see the margins are still pretty high. The S&P, Mini S&P is $6,000. Uh, the Mini Nasdaq is around $5,800, $6,000, I believe. Gold, $3,400. You can see down there the whole chart. But towards the, the bottom, you'd have the proposed size for the micro contract. So the, at one-tenth the size, the micro notional value would be $14,000. Uh, the micro NASDAQ will be about fourteen. The micro Dow, the E-mini micro, excuse me, the micro E-mini Dow will be 13400 And the micro E-mini Russell 2000 will be just under $8,000. So again, these are smaller products. In some cases, very small with the, the, the micro Russell. And again, uh, if you just find that to be too small, you could do multiples of it, three contracts, four or five contracts. It just offers a lot of flexibility for certain traders with certain strategies. All right, so here it is, pictures worth a thousand euros. I was talking about, uh, or pictures worth a thousand words. I was talking about this great bull market over the last few years. This is the great bull market, basically, that was interrupted by two bear markets, one in 2000, 2001. And uh, uh, the one, obviously, the financial crisis in 2007, 2008, and part of 2009. Go back to 1982, towards the very far left there. We launched the standard S&P, launched in April 82. First day volume was just under 4,000 contracts, followed by the standard mid-cap 400, the Russell 2000, and um, eventually a Dow contract when we merged, merged with the Chicago Board of Trade long ago. Then we have this big bull market in the 80s and the 90s, one of the greatest bull markets in the history of US finance. And uh, the notional value of the S&P got to be very large. The margins were $35,000 at one point. The average retail and active trader had an uh, account nowhere near that size. So we launched an E-mini S&P future, E meaning electronically traded, mini meaning a smaller size relative to the standard pit traded S&P. Well, deja vu, we are living that life all over again, and uh, we've had a nice bull market since 2009, and basically the standard for the S&P 500 has gone up four or five fold. So we have that same problem again, and you know, hopefully, you know, for, the, for the sake of the United States and the economy and the country, uh, in 10, 20 years, we have this issue again that the micro E-minis are so large because of a bull market, but we never know. I'm just uh, prognosticating out loud there. But uh, so it's a nice problem to have. What? I'm sorry. I said it's a nice problem to have. Yes, it is. Um, so we're gonna on May 6th. Uh, that's Monday, May 6th. But we'll, they'll start trading Sunday night, May 5th. But that will be for trade date May 6th. Uh, we will launch four micro e minis: the S&P 500, the micro e mini, the Nasdaq 100, micro e mini Russell 2000, and the micro e mini Dow futures. So the debut is May 6th. That's a week from, uh, well, actually, it's only in a, it's less than a week now. It's coming up this Sunday. All right, so why should you trade micro e-mini futures? We'll go through all 12 of these, but we'll go through them very, very fast. Uh, execution costs and liquidity. Generally, when you're talking futures, especially most of our primary futures contracts, and we're hoping the micro e-mini will follow this, uh, execution costs and liquidity. Uh, pound for pound futures contracts are just one of the cheapest ways to trade. And if you don't believe me, take the average daily notional dollar volume of the E-mini S&P and compare it with all 7,333 ETFs around the world. We're going to have a slide on that later on, and we'll talk more about it. There is just so much more trading in futures markets than there is in the cash market in most products and in the competitive product, too. So uh, great liquidity, uh, very low execution costs, or relatively low execution costs. Second reason, capital efficiencies. The nice thing is you have leverage with these things, and with uh, micro e-mini, you'll have to put down a very, very small amount of money. Uh, I think some people will spend more on Starbucks coffee in the next month or two than they would have to put down for the margin on a micro e-mini S&P. Three, you got around-the-clock trading, which we've had for a long time, um, so that's good. Uh, strategic reasons, there's things you can do with futures like spread trading. Uh, spreading one futures contract versus another, we'll have an example of that later. You can, you can do it in stocks, you can do it in ETFs, but it will cost a lot more money. Uh, it's a pure direct play on markets and asset classes. You know, you want to play FANGs, you can do that. Uh, but if you get caught in a downdraft with FANGs, it could be very, very, very costly. It's nice to be able to play the whole market. And micro E-minis, like our E-minis, will allow you to do that. Uh, full offset with E-mini futures. Some people will refer to this as fungibility. Be careful here. They're offsettable. They're not totally fungible in terms of you can't take an E-mini 
call the clearinghouse or call your firm and say, I want 10 micros. You can't do that. You can buy an e-mini and offset it with 10 e micro e-minis or have 10 micro e-minis and offset it with a e-mini. You can do that, but you can't convert one to the other, but they are offsettable. So that's a good thing too. It'll allow a lot of trading flexibility. Uh, seven, uh, I talk to new traders sometimes. Uh, one of the things that people really have difficulty sometimes that once you master it, you're on your way to becoming a much better trader is risk management. Our clearinghouse margining system forces active risk management. Um, if you, It's been said that if you don't have good risk management, the futures markets are a perfect place for you because they will impart risk management on you because if you uh, don't do well, you'll get a margin call or you'll be sold out of your position. So you want to have make sure your risk management is good and do your homework in that area. Uh, eight, you can more precisely scale in or out of positions to fine tune exposure. So let's say you're a one lot trader, but ah, you're not so positive about a particular trade. Instead of doing a one lot e-mini, you could do six or seven contracts in the micro. And uh, again, get in later if you're, you know, you get a little bit more courage or conviction on the position. So again, a lot of flexibility, having a much smaller contract, it'll round out a lot of strategies that a lot of traders do. Tax considerations, uh, we'll talk more about this. This is the one thing that gets a whole heck of a lot of people to trade futures over stocks or ETFs. You get favorable tax consideration. The Internal Revenue Service is one entity that always gets a take, but legally you want to pay as little as possible and futures allow you to do that. Uh, ten, uh, the tenth reason, technical indicators, fundamental indicators, everything you do in stocks and ETFs are just as easy to do in futures and in the micro E-minis. Doesn't matter if it's relative strength, oscillators, fundamental economic news, you can, all those things apply to futures and therefore the micros. Uh, 11, stock index futures, you can do things and they offer advantages that equities and ETFs don't. Uh, and the 12th, a uh, little bragging rights here, Merck's been in business for about two centuries. So um, I don't mean to sound arrogant here, but we kind of know what we're doing. We've assembled a lot of infrastructure, a lot of market making programs, a lot of uh, different types of customers out there. We've been courting these customers for decades and decades and decades, and it's given us some fantastic liquidity. So that's a good thing too. All right, so here's the contract specs. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on them because believe it or not, most of this chart here on page 12, slide 12, looks just like the E-mini. Um, all the cash settlement going to the SOQ, all the price limits, uh, the uh, overnight price limits, the day trading limits, the circuit breaker, 7, 13, 20% are going to be the same as the E-mini. The micros will be the same as the E-mini. Uh, the contract month, same thing, March quarterly uh, cycle, so March, June, September, and December. Trading hours will be the same. Trading ends, the same third contract, third Friday of the contract month. The only thing that's different is the ticker symbols, the contract multiplier, the minimum price fluctuation in dollars, and also for the calendar spreads. Uh, we don't, we're not sure how many people are going to do calendar spreads in the micros, but we have them up there just in case. So you can see uh, the ES is the ticker symbol for the mini S&P. The micro will just be have an M in front of it, MES for micro ES. Uh, it'll be a $5 contract multiplier, which is one-tenth what the mini S&P is, which is 50. So this is $5 times whatever the S&P futures are trading at. Minimum price fluctuation, it's just like in points, it's just like the mini S&P. It's a quarter of a point. But instead of equaling $12.50, do the math, it's $1.25, one-tenth. Same thing for the mini, uh, micro E-mini NASDAQ 100, the micro E-mini Russell 2000. No need to go over all these contract specs. You can kind of study them on their own. This thing will probably be archived, I believe. I also make uh, these slides available to anyone if they want to go into the details. But we don't want to be here till midnight, so we're not going to go over everything and every chart because there's a lot of information here. But the contract specs are very, very simple to follow. And like I said, to repeat, this bears repeating, it, um, it follows most of the stock index futures protocols. All right, just uh, another slider. This uh, basically is a print screen from our website, and it's just the settlement price of the E-minis. The micros aren't trading yet. They're not trading until May 6th, so we don't have those yet, but they should trade very, very close to the E-minis, and those trade very close to the S&P 500. All three indexes should track the underlying cash instrument, all right, which is the S&P 500. Uh, all the instruments, uh, the E-mini NASDAQ and the micro E-mini NASDAQ should track the NASDAQ 100 cash index. So they should trade pretty close to each other. Our arbitrageurs, spreaders, market makers will come into play and they'll help force things back in the line. That's your hope, that you have enough liquidity to keep things in the line. But hey, hey, uh, Dave, this chart, 
Yeah. How do you compensate for the initial liquidity? Do you think the slippage will be high right off the bat? Do you, how do you guys, you guys have a plan for that? All right, good question. I will uh, address it right now because it's important and we're doing okay on time. We're gonna have 20 market makers. By the way, a little, little trivia here for the mini S&P launch, there were no market makers. We're gonna have 20. And I think 10 of them are gonna do the US time zone, eight of them are gonna do the foreign time zones. Actually, I think all 20 will be available for the US time zone. Don't quote me on this yet. We're just getting all the bid sheets in and everything like that. Uh, so it's hard to say what the liquidity would be, but I'm really excited about it. I think it's going to be good. I think it, you know, it'll nice. be no more than, I, I can't quote it, but mm -hmm. uh, the market makers, when you have 10 or 20 of them, plus all the active traders out there and all the people that are going to play the I mean, I, I can't help but think it's going to be good. If, if there's slippage, a lot of slippage, no one will trade it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, I think with 20 market makers, we should do okay. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs> all right. Sure. So you see their open high, low, last change, settlement, Globex volume and open interest. Again, this is just what it'll look like uh, when it trades. This is the E-mini S&P, but the micro should look very similar to this. We're hoping the volume's the same. That would be really nice to trade 1.6 or 1 million contracts a day. But uh, no contract has ever traded a million contracts in its first day, first week, first month, first year. The most successful futures contract in the world didn't come close to a million even in its second year or third year, or fourth year. It takes a while to get to a million, but uh, with the mini S&P, we got there pretty quickly. We got there in four or five years, I think, which is amazing. Uh, at the bottom, it just shows how you calculate the notional value. With the mini, it's 50 times the value of the S&P, so it's 146,900. The micro will just be a $5 multiplier, so one-tenth that, 14,690. And on the next page now, we have, again, we have all the ticker symbols, the initial margins, the maintenance margins, uh, margin is a percent of the underlying value. Maintenance margin is a percent. Now remember, margins are, you can all fill in the blank, subject to change. These can change before the contract launches. So uh, check the website, the Merck website, all the margins will be up. Uh, for a trade held overnight, uh, the brokerage firm has to post at least that much margin. An intraday trade though, that can then be substantially less. Uh, we also have the futures price multiplier and the notional value. And then I just have a real quick summary at the bottom that shows the E-mini multiplier right next to the micro E-mini multiplier for the NASDAQ 100, the Dow, and the Russell 2000. So I like to put a lot of information in. People can go back and reference it. Uh, feel free to use these slides anytime you want. All right, so let's get into a, a trade. This is actually a real trade that happened here. I'm going to grab a little water. Um, being at the Merck 31 years, I've got a few friends in the, uh, out there in the trading world. This guy runs a hedge fund. It's called Trans Rubicon Trading. Uh, don't look it up. It's his own private money. <laughs> and uh, it's a friend of mine. His name is Larry, and he's got a lot of trading systems. He's got a very interesting one that trades uh, on the mini S&P, RSI, and volatility alone. Uh, it doesn't give a lot of signals, but this day, particular time, this uh, area in time, uh, this window in time, it did very, very well. So, uh, so this is a real trade. Let's look at how it, we're, we're only doing this, not showing you, I'm not trying to brag about a friend that is a really good trader. I'm trying to show you how the micro will look and give you a perspective in the micro versus the mini versus the S&P 500, the standard. So his system, it's an e-mini uh, system. Uh, he buys uh, any RSI below 20 in a spike in the at the money volatility in the uh, S&P options above 30% or in the VIX above 30% generates a buy signal. He immediately exits the trade, any RSI, RSI for those who don't know is a relative strength index, uh, any reading above 70. Well, by the way, this happened on Christmas Eve and February 20th respectively. So how would the three contracts, again, we're just trying to give you a perspective, for any new or novice traders out there, you should have an appreciation for how much these things are gonna move. So again, as a novice trader or a beginning trader, what's your risk tolerance? How much capital do you have? And consider these things as we look at the next couple of charts. So here it is. Here's that ugly fourth quarter we had in the equity markets. The S&P intraday was down about 18, 19%. The Russell and the NASDAQ 100 were down much more than 20%. They basically just caved in the latter part of December. So you can see there, on the, you see the chart, uh, bar chart, courtesy barchart.com. Um, and you also have in the bottom frame there the relative strength index. You see that green line and it, a little bit it dips below the red line. Uh, that's when it went below 20. That's the RSI below 20. 
And that green line goes above to the blue line above. That's when it's getting to 70 or above. It just just breached 70 on February 20th, but it went to like 18 or 19 on December 24th, triggering a signal because volatility spiked to 36% on that day. So how did the trade look? Well, I give you the notional values of the three contracts. The initial margin would have been required. And interesting there, look at the initial margin, 30,000 versus 6,000 for the mini versus 660 if the micro minis had been trading. Uh, the risk in points, it was a very volatile time. He threw his risk parameters way up there, 30 points. Uh, risk in dollars, 7,500 versus 15 versus 150. Entry price, the same. Exit price, the same. The gain in points, the same, 437 points. Look at the gain in dollars, uh, 109,000 versus 21 versus 2185. So you can see uh, a micro trader could do well. Uh, it's just a smaller amount of money, but it's a smaller amount of risk. And people say, ah, risk award, that's good, it's good. Uh, it reduces risk, but it also reduces reward. But you know what? New traders uh, need to pay more attention to risk than reward. When they get the risk taken care of, the war reward will come later, hopefully. But uh, you don't, you don't want to overtrade. And again, if you think it's too small, you don't have to trade one of them. You could trade two or three or four. And when you get up to seven, eight, or nine, you're, you, know, you just trade a mini if you want. That's the flexibility that we offer by offering the micro. Okay, let's compare uh, the E-mini, the complex, and the micros versus the SPY ETF, the most popular of the ETFs in terms of assets under management and average daily volume. I think it's number one or number two or number three. So the ticker symbol, very simple, MES for micro E-mini S&P 500 versus SPY. Contract multiplier, we've already gone over. It's one-tenth of the mini S&P, 2,800 approximately, times $5 of the contract, is around 14,000. Actually, when I made this slide, we were at 2,800. We've rallied nicely in the last few weeks. We're at 2,900 now. So uh, notional value of the micro will be 14,000. The notional value of one S&P, because they trade shares of SPY, Shares, $288 a share, $14,000 per contract for a micro. Uh, the number of SPY to equal one micro will be 50. Uh, around the clock trading, yes in the micro, basically no in the SPY. There are some firms, a couple of them, that will let you trade overnight, or completely overnight, 24-7. Very illiquid, though. You'll never see the liquidity in the SPY overnight that you do in the S&P 500. All right. Just go back to Brexit. Go back to the uh, November 2016 elections. Go back to the Swiss bank announcement. Uh, just oh, a lot of times when there was some overnight violence and something happened in Asia, something happened in Europe, the E-mini has had tremendous liquidity. And we're hoping the micros, we're going to hopefully transfer some of that liquidity and uh, use our you know, knowledge and expertise and, and all our great clients to help get good liquidity rather quickly in this. Management fee, there are none with futures. Uh, 0.0945 for the Spider ETF. Uh, average daily dollar volume of the adjacent E-mini product and ETF. Well, we don't have any data on the micro yet. It'll take a while to get to 220 billion, but the E-mini S&P 500 does 220 billion a day. If we can get just a fraction of that in the micro, it'll be a really spectacular product and a lot of people will be happy trading it. Uh, 220 billion for the E-mini S&P versus 24 billion for the SPY. Um, I'll make a prediction here. I think the micro, micros will eventually, this is a personal prediction, I think they will do very well. Will they surpass the SPY? In time, I believe they will. Could be wrong, but again, that's not the Merck's viewpoint, that's mine. I just think that we have so much critical mass and in stock index futures that uh, we, could, we, could, we could lap the SPY and some other ETFs too. And you'll see why on the next chart or the second one after this. Margin 4.3% or 660 bucks on the micro. Uh, it's 10 times that basically on the e mini S&P. Regulation T margin on the SP, uh, SPY, that would make it um, 50%. So you'd have to put up $140 per share for regulation T margin. Margin efficiency, uh, excuse me, margin efficiencies for spreading. Uh, yes with micros, yes with the E-minis, no with the SPY. Investor protections, we have the clearinghouse. The uh, equities and ETF world has uh, CIPIC, uh, Security Investor Protection Corporation. Um, which one's better? They're both great. S SIPC is an insurance thing. Uh, it's, it's got a few billion dollars in it. I think, you know, in, in a cataclysmic market, uh, the Fed would come to the rescue. Uh, it's never had to be rescued ever, so it's not even worth talking about. The Clearinghouse, been around for a long time. We, we you know, we, uh, during times of major stress in the financial world, the Clearinghouse has performed flawlessly. So, 
uh, very good investor protections. Uh, regulatory agencies, we have the CFTC, the Commodity Future Trading Commission. Uh, SPY has the Security and Exchange Commission, the SEC. Tax treatment, this is where we win. 60-40 rule, we'll talk more later, versus ordinary income on a short-term gain. All right, so this slide here, it's just a bar chart that shows uh, the CME product, the E-mini S&P 500, versus the three S&P 500 ETFs. There's the SPY, the IVV, which is the iShare S&P 500, and the VOO, which is the Vanguard uh, ETF. And you can see there, and, and at the top, there's a black line that shows the multiplier. In other words, how many times, how much more, how much more of a multiple there is to futures average daily dollar volume than the three exchange traded products or ETFs put together. We trade anywhere between seven and 10 times the futures average daily, average daily dollar volume is seven to 10 times what the ETFs are. So again, a lot of volume come in in the futures contracts. And one more chart just to show how we think stock index futures and the micros will be a pretty good success would be my guess. Uh, you look at the E-mini S&P 500 versus SPY, we've already covered that, 220 billion versus 24 billion, 9.2 times as much futures as ETF. The little statistic most people don't know, the E-mini S&P 500 versus all 7,333 ETFs traded around the world, it's 220 billion on a good day, all the ETFs in the world trade 100 billion. So we're two times, one futures contract, one little futures contract, the E-mini S&P 500, does more than all the ETFs in the world by a factor of 2.2. E-mini NASDAQ versus the QQQ, 67 billion is 6 billion. Mini Dow versus Dow Jones ETF, 27.7 versus one. And the Mini Russell, 11 versus three. So uh, I think the micros should do pretty good. Uh, again, we just have so many players in the market from the institutional side, proprietary trading side, active retail trader, active trader, and professional traders, uh, we, should, we should see good critical mass, hopefully quickly. But sometimes it takes time to, to build these things up. Okay, how have we done in the past with micro products? Is this our first micro? No, it's not. We've been around the block a few times on this. Um, like I said, we know what works, but some, we, we, we don't mind failing. Uh, I've been around a lot of contract launches. I've seen abysmal failures, but I've seen gigantic mega successes like the mini S&P 500, euro dollar futures, euro dollar options, treasury bonds and things like that. But we have a mini crude. It's not a true micro, but it's $32,000 notional value. So it could very well be a mini or, or a micro, but that's 18,600. It's about 1.55% of the uh, larger counterparts at WTI crude oil contract that trades about one point uh, 3 million a day. Uh, micro Euro FX does 17,000 a day. That's about 6% of its larger counterpart. Gold, 8,000 a day. Micro Aussie dollar, micro British pound, a little bit less in volume. I bring this up, this slide, because um, just a question to the audience out there. What do you think the largest, most actively traded contract is amongst active traders, retail traders, and prop traders? I'll let you know when they come in. Stock index futures. <laughs> <laughs> it's the E-mini S&P 500. So I can't help but think that uh, some of these percentage numbers here, uh, even if we see 1% or 2% on the micro E-mini, that'll translate to 32,000, 16 to 32,000 contracts a day uh, in the initial stages. If we get up to 5%, um, it's going to be, you know, 50, 100,000 contracts a day. And then that's it. We'll be off to the races. We'll have... um. Pretty good success, I think. Once you get once you get to fifty thousand in any contract, you're uh, you're doing pretty good. Uh, any exchange out there would like to have a contract that does fifty thousand a day. So uh, we're open. So it, it, it also micro e mini equities. They're a great complement to all the other micros. You can kind of do an asset allocation thing here with futures contracts. You can have metals, you can have oil, you can have currencies. Now they have a micro e mini S and P, so you can do a whole portfolio. All right. So let's look at this precision scaling um, flexibility here. Um, another trade, this is a, just an illustration though, all right? Although I do know a lot of CTAs that do this type of trading. Uh, we have a technical trader at a CTA in this illustration, all right? CTA is commodity trading advisor. Instead of trading stocks and bonds, they trade a portfolio of futures contracts. The guy's uh, really into charts and technical analysis. He's an RSI guy too. He sells one June E-mini. Remember, the micros aren't around now. But this is going to be an illustration that will bring in the micros in a second. 
Uh, so he sells at the breach of the neckline of the head and shoulders pattern. You can see the arrow there. Uh, and it's a 28, 26, 50 in the S&P 500. Uh, once that neckline is breached, he gets short. He would cover on any RSI reading below 30 on a five minute chart. So we, we uh, break the neckline. We decline pretty quickly. We rally back up towards the neckline as your standard procedure with a head and shoulders breach. And then we start falling apart pretty rapidly too. So uh, if you can see the RSI on the bottom frame, um, you can see the RSI breaks above 70 there before nine o'clock. And then it breaks below 30 right uh, around 11.30, 11.45. So the market goes in his direction. He covers roughly an hour later at 28.15.25, all right? So as many traders will, um, will identify with in this trade, if you buy, if you sell short one and then you cover one, you're flat. Now in this, this trade, you made money. That's great. You made money, but you're covered, you're flat. What, and look what happened. Look what happened afterwards now. About an hour later, it rallies back up and then starts to fall apart and takes out the lows uh, where you got out. And you thought, ah, great. If I could have done more than a one lot, that would have been great. But some people are not well enough capitalized to do more than a one lot in the mini S&P 500. But what if, what if the trader, instead of doing one mini S&P, he executed 10 micro E-minis? Neckline breaks. He could have covered a partial position when the neckline was broken. And, oh, excuse me, he could have covered a partial position when the RSI got to 30, and then if maybe let a few of them run. So cover five, and then let a few go, and then cover them, and then a few more go. So that's why I have three more arrows. Maybe he covers five of the shorts, uh, that first arrow, and then that skinnier arrow, he cover maybe two more, and then have one more running where he cover with the, that smallest and thinnest of arrows there uh, when the RSI again bounces down around 30. So again, just gives you more flexibility. This is scaling in, scaling out. A lot of professional traders do this. Um, I do it. Uh, I, everyone I know does it. You get in, you get out. It's not averaging a loss or anything like that necessarily, but it's a type of strategy that um, you'll average around a price and you can trade around it, so to speak. But you can also war if the trader could have executed originally, just like the one E-mini contract is the original example, and just slowly offset using micros he could have done that too. So instead of doing um, instead of doing micros, he could have done the mini, but he could have offset with micros. Covered five, then covered another three, then covered another two. Uh, so again, this is the whole thing. Uh, the fungibility, the offset, will allow you to offset one versus the other. You can't convert one to the other, but you can use them to offset. All right, let's. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time on this uh, slide, but. Talks about the Fang trade. Fangs were a wonderful story and a wonderful trade until they weren't. Uh, fourth quarter, a lot of people were eviscerated. It was really ugly. Uh, of course, they've come most of the way back. Some of them have come all the way back. Facebook's not too far. Amazon's about 87% eh, away from its all-time high. Not sure on Netflix. Google got massacred yesterday because of revenue miss. But uh, I want to call your attention to the second row there, average daily dollar volume. Facebook, $3 billion a day. Amazon, $8 billion a day. Netflix, $3 billion a day. Google, $1.8. The QQQ ETF, $6 billion a day. All the things together, just under $18 billion. All the things plus the QQQ, $25 billion. Shift over to the E-mini NASDAQ 100, $67 billion. So the E-mini NASDAQ does more than all the things and the QQQ put together. So again, great liquidity, great critical mass. We're hoping that translates to the micro too. So if you have a portfolio of technology stocks or you have some of the things, you can use the micro e-mini NASDAQ to hedge your position. Or instead of just trying to take your, uh, you know, make your bets, so to speak, with Facebook or Amazon or Netflix, uh, you can have a little bit more diversity by the micro e-mini instead of four things. And, uh, you know, you'll get the other 96 stocks with it uh, in the NASDAQ 100. So you have more diversity. Now, granted, with an index, you probably wouldn't hit the home run you would with Amazon or Facebook. But then again, on the downside, that pain can be mitigated by hedging with the micro E-mini or the mini NASDAQ, depending on how large your FANG portfolio is or how large a QQQ portfolio is. And the great thing about using the micros or the E-mini would be 60-40 tax treatment you get with futures, you don't with the things. Uh, you, get, you don't get 24-hour trading with the things, you do with futures. And the diversification, you get the other 100 issues with the QQQ, and you get them with, uh, obviously, the futures contract. So 
Uh, trading the micro E-mini will give you the same great advantages over trading FANGs as the E-mini NASDAQ 100. So we're looking for good volume in that one too. And again, the market makers will be making markets in not only the micro S&P, they'll be making markets in all the products. Okay, let's go. We're going to get into one more strategy and then cover a couple of things real quick. And uh, this seminar usually times at around 45 to 55 minutes. We're going to have a little bit of time for questions too. I told them I can go over a little bit beyond 4.30. So if you need to leave, you leave. That's okay. So what we have here is a correlation between the Russell 2000 and other U.S. equity indexes. Uh, I want to call your attention to the Russell 2000 correlation between that and the S&P 500. It's 0.812. And the correlation to the Dow, 0.749, and the NASDAQ, 100.58. Uh, the NASDAQ hardly correlates at all to the Russell 2000. The Dow, about 0.74, that's not bad. 0.81 on the S&P 500 correlation, that's even better. Uh, it's not perfect, 98, 99% would be a better correlation, but one of the nice things about this correlation is it allows spread trading. Um, gosh, I hope this software does not load now. <laughs> Uh, sorry about that. I, I have a software install going on now. I hope it doesn't interfere with this seminar. So um, we uh, have the correlation 0.81. They move not lockstep and barrel, but the S&P generally moves up and down with the Russell 2000, but not always. And sometimes these divergences uh, give you the opportunity to profit via spread trading. So uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about spreading with the micros. Um, so certain spreads, they require ratios and they're not one-to-one. -one. Sometimes you do one Russell to one S&P. Sometimes you do two Russells to one S&P. It depends. But the difference in notional amounts, ratios, different ratios are sometimes required. Uh, why do we have these ratios and why does the clearinghouse recognize certain? Because if you want margin offsets, you got to be done in a, it has to be done in accordance with the clearinghouse ratios. So you're going to check with your broker, uh, in this case, uh, case uh, stage five, um, and check the CME website to see the specifics of the spread trade you want to trade, and it will tell you what the offset is, what the ratio is. Um, so let's look at this thing. This is a chart. It's got a lot of data on it. We're going to skip around because I want to wrap up here and take questions. But this has the Russell 2000, the small cap stocks, and the S&P 500 large cap stocks going back 20 years. Now, as traders, we don't care about 20 microseconds, let alone 20 years. But suffice it to say, the small cap stocks over the long haul outperform the S&P 500. But there are times when they don't. And this is where opportunities for spread trading uh, are there. So I want to call your attention. Go all the way down to December 29, 2017. You can see the Russell was up 12.64% for the year. The S&P 500 was up 18.87. So the, uh, it beat the, the S&P, the large caps beat the small caps by... 623 basis points, or 6.23 percent. But look what happened just seven months later in July. The Russells were up 10.5 percent, and the S&P 500 was up only 4.8 percent. Why that huge swing there from you know negative 623 to positive 570, 5.70 percent? Why did the small caps outperform? Well, if you remember what happened around the summer of 2018, what did President Trump do? He started to enact tariffs, and the trade war began, and the trade and tariff issue with China and some other countries began to, uh, should we say, accelerate. As a result, multinational companies like, like Deere and Caterpillar and General Motors, they're going to be affected, impacted a lot more negatively uh, to tariff and trade issues. Therefore, there's kind of like a lid put on the S&P 500 because these large multinational corporations underperformed because people were worried about tariffs and how it would affect profits and sales. Uh, small cap stocks like the Russell 2000, uh, they're not as international. They don't have anywhere near the exposure globally. And so they didn't have this like artificial capping due to trade and tariff issues, and they outperform. But then you say, Dave, well, what happened in the fourth quarter there? The small caps went down 12%, and the S&P 500 by the end of the year was down 6.24%. It completely reversed again. Well, what happens in a bear market? They slaughter the most little less liquid, the least liquid things the most. The Russell's a little bit less, less liquid. Uh, smaller cap stocks, uh, when a large pension fund wants to sell a million dollars worth of small cap stocks, it goes down a lot more than selling a million dollars worth of uh, Johnson & Johnson or Citigroup. There's just that liquidity. There's just that risk. There's a little bit more risk embedded in small cap stocks. So that bear market in the fourth quarter uh, knocked small caps a lot more. The whole point to this is there's a lot of spread trading opportunities here just Within it, six or seven months, we went all over the place with this spread. 
So it's a little bit, it's not a, it's, you can day trade spreads. There's a lot of people that do them, but you know, they're held over, you know, days or weeks or sometimes months, they'll do a little bit better for you. Uh, we have outlook strategy and ratio on this next um, table here, and it basically just gives you the margin offset. We're looking at small caps versus large caps. You would need to do two micro E-minis versus one micro E-mini S&P 500. Two micro E-mini Russells versus one micro E-mini S&P 500. If you do it in that ratio, you get an 80% margin offset. So how does that look? Well, look on the right side of the screen here. The left side is just another chart that shows the ratios of all the spreads and the margin offset. And you can see some of these margin offsets are, are pretty large, 70, 75, 80%. So in this example, um, you're going to do two micro E-mini Russells. The margin's 391 apiece. So the margin on that leg will be $782. You would do one micro E-mini S&P. The margin's 660. So the gross margin on both legs is $1,442. But if you do them in the two-to-one ratio, the clearinghouse recognizes that you'll get a margin offset 80% discount. Total margin $288. That's dinner at a restaurant. So uh, it's a, not, a, not a bad margin at all to do a spread trade. And there's a lot of other spreads. I won't get into them all, but given what's happened to Boeing in the last couple of weeks and 3M Company, they all had adverse market moves, and they dragged the Dow down. There were days the S&P 500 was up 5, 10 points. The Dow was down 200 points or unchanged because Boeing and 3M, the, the Dow is a price-weighted index, and Boeing and 3M Corporation weighed on it dramatically. The S&P 500 is a cap-weighted index, so it's a little bit different. Uh, so there was a spread there, too, and maybe the opposite now. If Boeing and 3M recover, the Dow will outperform in the near term. But in the last couple of weeks, I think Boeing and 3M have been a drag on it. But uh, I haven't looked too closely, but it's something that would put a light on in my head for a possible spread trade. All right, next, and we're going to start to wrap up here, but um, the best thing about futures is your taxation. Uh, the slide here, the tax man cometh. Uh, the Internal Revenue Code applies to 337 million Americans. It's the one entity that always gets its take. Um, you want to give as little as possible. It's national sport in this country to pay as little taxes as possible. As long as you're doing it legally, that's great. Tax evasion as illegal. You don't want to do that. You'll go into jail. So we have two traders here, Trader A, Trader B. Uh, one makes $1,000 trading in the micro E-mini S&P. One make, trades a th makes $1,000 trading the S&P spiders, the spy, SPY. Trader A is taxed according to Section 1256 of the Internal Revenue Code. Forget Section 1256. All that is is known as the 60-40 rule. 60% <coughs> of your gain is taxed at long-term capital gain rates. By the way, I assume 32% tax bracket here just for this illustration. So long-term capital gain in the 32% tax bracket is 15%. It would be higher if you were in one of the higher tax brackets. 40% is taxed at ordinary income or 32%. So uh, someone in the 32% tax bracket will have a blended rate of 21.8%. There's a typo there. Uh, that should be 21.8%. Sorry about that. And he will give up $218 to the IRS. So Trader A keeps 782 per thousand and pays 218. Yeah, that'd be nice to pay 1.8% on your trades, but unfortunately that's a typo. It should be 21.8% is the blended rate in the 32% tax bracket. Trader B, the entire thing is uh, ordinary income. So he'll pay 32% or $320 for every thousand in profit. So he keeps 680 and pays 320 to the IRS. Now you may think big deal, $102 a day, big whoop. If you're a good trader, and I'm hoping that many of you are really good traders, over the course of a year, you make 50, 100, 200, 300,000 a year, that 100 bucks is going to add up. That's 100 per thousand dollars in profit. If you make six figures, this is substantial. If you're in a higher tax bracket, it could be even greater, depending. So remember, um, always consult a competent tax advisor. Again, the Internal Revenue Code applies to every American. I think there's only 10 people in the country that really understand it. All right, next, next thing, and then we'll wrap up, and we'll take questions because we're at 4.20. we got 10 minutes, theoretically, but we can go a little bit beyond that. What about the micro E-minis as an alternative to options? They're so small. They have a small notional amount. Some people are looking at them as a, basically an option where you don't have to worry necessarily about time decay and changes in volatility. 
So I, the best way I can uh, explain this is give you a quick example, but we all know options are great. They have great characteristics, small premiums, leverage, limited risk when you buy calls and puts, lots of strategies. But options require a different type of thinking, all right? Futures are two-dimensional. You think about up and down only. It's all you care about. That's your spread trader. Uh, with options, you care about up-down, and you also have to worry about time decay and changes in implied volatility, or vega. So can the micro help out here a little bit? Yes. Uh, so here's, uh, the, again, the fourth quarter of the S&P 500 is in blue, and the implied volatility is measured by the at-the-money strike is in green, and you can see it, sh it shot up above 30%, and the S&P 500 got wiped out. So here's a couple of columns, the, uh, the year and the date, uh, the micro futures price. Now, basically, this is the e-mini futures price I used. If the micros were trading, they would probably, we hope, would trade very close to the mini S&P. I have the implied volatility, changes in implied volatility affect options a lot. And then I have the March ES, the e-mini S&P 2800 call, and the e-mini, the March 2820 call. And you can see, what if you're a trader and you thought the market was going to go up appreciably? So you buy an option, and, you know, if it goes up enough, you make money. You have to go up enough to get to your break-even point, though. Uh, so let's look and see how the three trades did. So we started out February 26th of 2019. We went two full weeks into the March 2019 expiration, which was March 15th. 2019. Look at the micro futures price, or in the case, what it would have been had it been trading. 27.9150. We ended up at expiration at 28.1190. So we rallied 20 points. We had a couple of gut, gut lurching or sickening drops. We were down all the way to 27.47 one day. So that was a nice drop. Implied volatility from 12.43 uh, towards expiration was at 10.54. How's that going to affect your option? Drops in implied volatility suck premium out of your option. It's an adverse negative impact when volatility goes down on long options positions, especially a long call when, it, uh, when the market's not going your way. So the 2800 call option, you bought it at 23.4. It expired at 11.9. You uh, lost 11.5 or $575. So you were right. The market went up, but it didn't go up enough to get to your options break-even point. So the option actually lost 575 bucks. The 2820 call option didn't get anywhere near its strike. You lost the entire premium of 710. Now, I'm not knocking options. They're fantastic products. There's a lot you can do with them, but if you're not right in the direction pretty, pretty precisely, uh, you're going to lose some premium. All right? If you don't get volatility right and time decay right, you, uh, you're going to lose some premium. The micro, though, it rallied 20 points. So you made $102, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you delta adjusted these, because these are mini options, the mini S&P, the 2800 mini option had a delta such that it would take four micro contracts to equal the delta on this call option, and it would be three contracts to equal the delta on the 2820 call option. So instead of making $102, if you delta adjusted the whole strategy, you'd have made $400 on the micro, and $300 if you delta adjusted versus the 2820 call. So without getting too complicated here, what I'm saying is the micro would have done better and you would have had, I won't say limited risk because uh, if you go long, you know, the, the risk is $14,000. And that's if the S&P 500 goes to zero. Anyone know the last time the S&P 500 went to zero? It didn't. Uh, it lost 80% of its value in the depression, but uh, it, it's a it's 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 a more limited risk trade. It's not a risk free trade, but more limited risk. If you sold short uh, micros, then there's more more risk and there's less optionality, I believe. But it's something to consider because of its small size to um, consider, kind of like as an option in a very strange sort of way. All right, one other thing I put up here, and I think this is the last slide before all the uh, goodbyes and thank yous and uh, all the uh, references and phone numbers and stuff like that. I took uh, options volatility numbers that, and just converted them to daily numbers. So most volatility is annualized. I, I converted them to daily volatilities, weekly and monthly. So you can see there what you can expect in a high volatility environment or a medium volatility environment or a low volatility environment. Right now, we're in a medium volatility environment. I just estimated about 15%. And you can see what the average daily moves are in the uh, mini S&P versus the micro, what it would be if it was trading. So one standard deviation move, uh, a move of greater than that only occurs one out of every three times. Two out of three times, it will be less than that. So 1,220 in a medium 
volatility environment, the mini S&P, on average, two out of three days will be a $1,220 daily move from top to bottom. Just on average, medium volatility day, one standard deviation. The micro would be one-tenth of that, $122. Uh, three standard deviation move you'd expect, or two standard deviation move you'd expect one time out of 20 events. So basically, one trading, one day out of every trading month, you'd move $2,400 in a day. The micro E mini will move 244. All right, and a three standard deviation move only occurs about two times every 200 trading days, or one time every 100 trading days, roughly. So you'd have $3,600. Um, that would be a very big day, big move, big day, and uh, it'll be 366 for the micro. So you can see, I just put this up here so people can see what they can expect in move movement. All right, so real quickly as we wrap up, we're going to have market makers, as I talked about. Uh, we have this fungibility or offset feature. Price quotes will be available through all the major quote vendors, uh, and you can also see delayed quotes at cmbgroup.com. Uh, if you're new to futures, uh, Please do your homework. Uh, there, you're going to have to have a futures account. You can't trade these through a security account. It's not hard to open a futures account. It's very easy. Margin with futures is different than it is with stocks and ETFs. You, um, with stocks and ETFs, you have to borrow 50% and put up 50%. With futures contracts, you put up a small deposit, 4 5 6%, and it's uh, much easier. Shorting futures is a lot easier than shorting stocks and ETFs. And uh, there's some minimum requirements depending on the various firms out there up there. So uh, check in with uh, State Tribe Trading. Uh, CME Institute is a great place to go, uh, especially if you're a new trader and there's a trading simulator on there. There's classes, all sorts of resources. You can go to cme.com slash education to do that. Uh, check on your key economic reports. They can move the market dramatically sometimes. And uh, we'll skip the key takeaways and we'll get right into contact. I'm Dave Lerman, the presenter. Email me. Free, feel free to email me. The folks at Stage 5 can take very, very good care of you. But um, beyond that, uh, feel free to contact me or any of these people on this page. Thank you again uh, on behalf of all of you that logged in. We really appreciate it. We're uh, going to take some questions now and I'll stick around for a little bit. Thanks, Dave. Oh, Thanks by the that. way. If you're ever having a really bad day, remember in 1976, Ronald Wayne sold his 10% Apple stake for 2300 bucks. Mona, I love this slide. It's now worth $70 billion. <laughs> That is a bad day. <laughs> and uh, for everyone out there, that's my uh, contact information. Phil, shoot me an email. We have a special futures.io micro e-mini pricing. So please reach out to me, either by phone or email. And let's get some questions. Uh, do you think, Dave? Do you think this will reduce liquidity in your current E mini e in your current E mini ES and NQ products? Uh, no, because there are so many players in the E mini S and P 500. I, I I can't. You know, there might be a little bit of cannibalization at mm -hmm. some point, but uh, we we're constantly getting new people in the market. There's more and more money passively indexed to the S and P 500. And the market's grown dramatically over the years. If you look at what the E-mini did 10 years ago versus what it's doing now, a uh, lot of different options players in there, a lot of combination players and stuff like that. I only see the, I could see the pie growing a lot. This could help bring a lot of new traders in that might at some point graduate to the mini. I agree. I think this could pull in a lot of those young millennial traders that might not be able to trade the E-mini, essentially. Exactly. And ETF traders, too. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I have a few questions about day margins. You know, that's that's specific towards me. Just shoot me an email again. We can go into more detail about the specifics in terms of, you know, day margin for the uh, micros. Also, you can hold them overnight uh, as long as you have the margin to hold them overnight. Uh, let's see. Any other questions out there? I'm just going to make a quick comment with uh, a lot of people. I, I used to trade the micro currencies. And uh, the question about holding overnight, that was one of the best ways I learned how to swing trade was the low margin and being able to hold it a longer time frame. So I think this micro ES will allow a lot of traders to do that with ES to get out of that day trading mindset more into maybe swing trading. So, Yep, yeah, I agree. Uh, any chance for a micro CL? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. No plans for that right now. We have we have a we have a mini crude oil, which is you know a small, very small contract. Um, no plans uh, at this time for a micro crude oil or a micro bond or you know uh, any other thing. 
uh, options, no plans now for options on the micro, but you know, we want to, first things first, you develop core liquidity first in your futures, and then uh, maybe later on, depending on customer demand, you uh, consider an options contract. Yep. And for Paul, yes, uh, they do generate 1099s. Uh, another thing that I, uh, you know, I just want to add what I like about this is, or what I enjoy about the micros is um, the NQ. The NQ, the NQ whips around. We all know that. Uh, the, you know, it, that thing moves, and it could scare some people. But I, what I like about the micros is you can kind of get that feel with a micro on in the, in the MNQ to kind of see what an 100 point swing is back down 80 points, and that's what I am looking forward to about these micros. It's just to be able to get the feel for, in my personal opinion, the feel for the actual movement, price action of the contract without risking as much as, uh, as say the E-mini NQ. And uh, any other questions out there? All right, well, Dave, thanks again for joining. You're very Bucks welcome. We thank you folks for hosting this. Thank you. And uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out. All right. Thank you both. Again, if you have any questions on commissions, pricing, stuff like that, you can email Max and he can take care of you. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks for the uh, webinar and information and for spending some time with us this evening. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone.